Hello again, gang. K.R. King here, helping one and all homebrew their own D&D campaign. So this is the final video in my series on Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 2. And today I'm going to talk about the GM secrets contained therein. And I use <laughs> sneer marks here because they're not really secrets as much as sort of tricks of the trade. You know, concepts and ideas you should take notice of when you're either running this module or if you're designing, you know, a mega dungeon for your homebrewed campaign. And these are techniques that are going to make your dungeon, you know, more playable, more fun, and a little more believable. And, you know, again, I'm using the sneer marks because, you know, the mega dungeon is kind of the nexus point for the suspension of belief in D&D. So we're going to suspend our disbelief, but you do want to think about these concepts. I talked about six of these in the last summation, uh, Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 1, which is where are the entrances and exits? Uh, what are the rewards and risks of exploring the entire level? Uh, who are the major power centers uh, in the dungeon? Uh, dynamic versus static in terms of dungeon design. And what are the resource drains on the dungeon? And now I'm going to add a seventh, which is because you're going deeper, you're after, after level one, now you're going to be dealing with interlevel contextuality, which really is just a fancy word for saying the shit that happens up here affects the shit that happens down here. All right, gang, so I am going to start with the you know, last item, the newest concept, the interlevel contextuality, or shit rolls downhill, because I do think it affects a lot of the other concepts that I talked about. So, for instance, with a dynamic versus static dungeon, uh, once you start to go lower, you start to you know, have creatures that are passing through levels, right, and to get into the dungeon... Uh, same thing with entrances and exits. How, you know, do you have exits at lower levels? We'll see on level three, they do. And, and how does this affect, you know, uh, the, the, how things are interacting with one another? And we see this already with Haleth the Revenant on level one, killed by three members of the Fine Fellows of Daggerford. If the players decide to, you know, work with Haleth, he is going to take them uh, to these other three. He's going to try to kill them and go to the next world. And the Fine Fellows are on level two. So, of course, the most far-reaching, you know, inter-level contextual uh, personages of the Mad Mage's dungeon is the Mad Mage, Halister himself. He loves to appear before the players on every level. He makes it obvious that he's scrying on them and watching them. You know, he teleports in monsters to bedevil the players. He sets up all sorts of puzzles and things. You know, he's having fun at every level interacting with the players. And if you look at the setup, he has some tasks that he could ask the players to perform for him. And of course, Halister provides some, you know, contextual cohesion, as it were, to the levels by limiting the teleports. You can't use those to go from one level to another. You must go through the gates that he has created, protected by the Elder Runes. And the lesson here, as always, if you have a big bad villain, uh, you know, at the final level of your mega dungeon, you should have him or her or it, you know, interacting with the players as they make their way through. Perhaps just through the minions, but it's kind of cool the way Halister has this, I know you're coming, I know you're there. Then when the players do, you know, defeat the big bad villain's minions, solves all his puzzles, you know, disarms all his traps, that final confrontation, there's some beef there. You know, and another obvious, you know, inter-level connection are the minions of Xanathar who have various watch posts. And this is something that can both hinder and help the players. So, for example, on level one, they defeat the goblin bugbears, but some goblins escape. They go down to level two and they warn the other watch posts, hey, these players, you know, they describe them, are coming to get us. But let's say the players capture someone, say Sylvia the Were Rat on level one. She may give them information about what's down here, you know, uh, provide something about this, this is the areas to avoid or whatnot. Because Sylvia may have gone down to this level. And so the players can use this information. They'll start to realize, you know, if you capture things or negotiate with creatures, they're going to give some information to change how they play. Also, it provides you with an opportunity. If the players get stumped by something, they can't figure out a puzzle or whatever, uh, let some other creature, maybe they've had, you know, dealings with this puzzle or heard about it to give the players some information. And of course, if you have items that uh, can help the player, let's say the Wand of Secrets on level one, they can take it to different levels and it'll help them find secret doors. 
So you're always thinking about stuff that's going on in these higher levels. How does it affect stuff below? And then sometimes vice versa. All right, so as I asked on level one, is it necessary for the players to explore every hallway, every room on level two? And what that means is, are there you know, items or bits of information that's absolutely necessary for the players to get to lower levels, you know, solve puzzles or you know, defeat monsters? And just as with level one, technically no, but it's a good idea to look through every nook and cranny. And the designers do avoid that old, you know, the old adventure game trap of having some item or something that it, it, you're just stuck if you don't have it. What they do is the reward system of sprinkling treasure throughout the dungeon. Now, they do have one item, this amulet symbol of Xanathar that Rizzerol the Draw Mage has in Area 14, which, you know, allows the players to get past the Beholder Zombie in Room 28. Don't have to have it, but it's a good idea. In terms of entrances and exits, you have uh, the stairway here at the opposite end of level two that anyone can just access if they find the stairs. It also has several uh, routes that you can travel through to get there. One through this hallway eight, as I mentioned, being quicker. That way players, when they already explored the level, could quickly go through there. And of course, the map in the book has these, you know, exits potential to create, you know, expand the dungeon if you so choose. I'm a little mm, about that. If I'm playing a module, why do I don't want to make the dungeon. I'll just play what they have. I've just eliminated those in my redrawing of this in Dungeon Draft. All right, and then you have gates that provide the only teleport ability uh, down multi-levels. Uh, on the level one, we had one gate that went to level 10, but you had to be 11th level or higher to use it because of Jazeera Kesselhart put this on there to protect the players, you know, as a game mechanic. And I talked extensively about the utility of this, you know, anti-teleport thing that Hallister says and the gates uh, in my discussion of level one. But you know what's interesting here is on level two, you have three gates. One in room five that goes to level four of players of eighth level or higher. One in room 12 that goes to the fifth level dungeon, uh, again, uh, accessible only by players who are eighth level or higher. And then one in room 20C that goes to the sixth level, but you've got to be ninth level or higher. So why do they do that? Well, because if you have a high level party of 11th level or higher, you just want to go to level one, go to the gate and go down to level 10. You've already gone through the dungeon. Also, you've gone up. Maybe you've done other things, you know, resting or, you know, who knows what. You don't want to have the players have to slog their way through all these levels. But until they get to 11th level, you've got these other gates that provide shortcuts to, you know, four, five and six. Now, what's interesting, on the 6th level, you have gates that take you to the 13th and 18th level dungeon. Obviously, very high. But this provides a way, you know, you go to level 2, then you go to 6th, then you go to 13, 18. And here's the thing. They have online, uh, people have put together charts that show the gates, uh, where, how the linkages from the gates on all the different levels of the Mad Mage. It's really interesting to see how they set this up, which levels have more gates than others, and you can really see the ideas here about what levels the players are going to be, how they have to make their way, especially as you go to the really deep levels. All right, so there's three major power centers on level two. You have the goblin bugbears uh, in area one, uh, led by Yek, who's been transformed into the handsome human uh, by the circlet of human perfection. You have two Xanathar watch posts, one in area nine, one down here in area 20. And then you have, I guess, a minor power, but he still is one, Rizaril the Drow Mage here in area 14 with his eight wear rats. Now it's very interesting that the designers chose to split up these Xanathars to two different watch posts. Imagine if they were together, they would be very powerful. So part of this may be a game mechanic in order for players have suggested at sixth level to be able to take these things on, but they do have specific tasks up at Area 9, they're there to watch the goblins in their marketplace and everything. And then down in Area 20, they are sort of guarding both the stairs, you know, or watching anyone who's going to go through the stairs to Level 3, where they have interests. And they're guarding this gate in Room 20C. They know the gate is there, but they don't know how to use it. Now, what's curious to me is the purpose of these goblins 
uh, you know, and the bugbear guards about setting up this marketplace. You know, as I said in the earlier video, and this relates to static versus dynamic, if they did have an ongoing marketplace, there's going to be customers, there's going to be other people selling stuff or trading. You're going to have more activity in the room than is given in the text, unless maybe they just set this up and no one's there. It's too dangerous to go here and it's about to blow up in their face. I don't know. Players are the first customers. And in the aftermath, at the end of the chapter on level two, it talks about the goblets. If the Xanathar posts are destroyed by the players, then they're going to expand their operations. Uh, if the players injure them, they're going to start setting up more traps and being more protective. It doesn't say anything about Xanathar or Rizaril, presumably because both of these, you know, Rizaril works for these other houses and Xanathar is going to be around. So you're going to get more information about that on deeper levels. You know, and this mystery uh, as to the aims of the goblins and even Rizaril and whatnot relates to the, you know, static versus dynamic. Just to review, I call a static dungeon one in which all the creatures and NPCs are all set just in space until the players interact and they come to life. A dynamic dungeon presumes that these their creatures are here before the players get there. They're moving around. They're interacting with one another, possibly at cross levels. And this should be reflected in where they are and what they're doing when the players encounter them. And, you know, and to their credit, the designers do try to set up some dynamic stuff. You have the goblins, you know, making the stage uh, to set up a sail point in Area 1 when the players encounter them. And the fine fellows of Daggerford uh, presumably were running uh, just before the players do. And they find them in, you know, varying forms of distress or not. So, for instance, uh, you have Rex the Hammer when the players come along. Uh, in Area 13, that he's right in the middle of a battle, almost dead from Mesoloths and Nothics. You have another one that's been captured by the goblins in Area 1. They've shaved off his beard. And then you have one that's not in distress, Midna, the priest in Room 11B, who's just there. She's found this room that, you know, Halaster every day provides food and drink for up to 12. But you also have some issues because, you know, for instance, this 11B with the food and drink. Why wouldn't Xanathar's watch post who are presumably, you know, moving around and investigating things and keeping an eye on things, have never discovered this room where every day, room, you know, food and drink for 12, you think they would want to seize this. And would the insatiably hungry ghouls in room 7B really just put themselves in barrels and, you know, wait all day for someone to come by? And if you don't touch the barrels, they just let them pass? You know, why hasn't anyone taken control of the well in room 2A that provides 1D4 plus 1 gallons of potable water a day? That's, you know, pure gold. And what exactly is Rizril doing in Area 14? He doesn't seem powerful enough to take on either of the Xanathar watch posts. So why is he positioned here? Well, he's positioned there to wait for the players to come along and give them the symbol, potentially, and information about, you know, the watch post in Area 20. So the thing about having a dynamic dungeon is you got to be consistent and you got to come up with reasonable explanations for why creatures are where they are and what they're doing. And there's going to be some creatures, you know, that are just waiting for someone to come along, but, you know, not all. So with the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Halister is the easy out in terms of a lot of these things. So, so maybe he just started supplying the, you know, food and drink for 12 when Midna took this over. Uh, maybe he zaps anyone that, you know, camps out at the well too long or, you know, tries to make some cash off it. And he could magically keep the ghouls in the barrels because he loves to watch, you know, when they spring out and attack a party. And in terms of Rizaral, you know, maybe he just has arrived here. He's just scouting things out, trying to figure things, you know, what the strength is. Uh, maybe he's had an encounter with the Xanathar watch post. They came back here to kind of, you know, lick his wounds and wait for someone to come along, the players that can help him. So the thing is, a dynamic dungeon, you got to be consistent. You got to come up with timelines for things that make sense. All right, and so finally we have every player's favorite uh, thing, resource drains. And we've got our fair share here on level two. You've got this whole ooze area where the you know, rewards are kind of limited. You know, you got the big freeze room of 18 that just does cold damage. No treasure, no information. You got the rust monsters in room 17. Always a pain. And if you're going to have wandering monsters, of course, those are classic resource drains. Well, here's the thing. You can just say that a resource drain is the price of adventuring, right? You know, if you, it's like owning a house or a car, you're going to have maintenance costs. You know, you do have to pay the freight for things. But you know, you have another interesting form of a resource drain on level two, and those are what I call atmospheric rooms, which they drain playing time 
and potentially spells. So for example, you have Halister's puppet in room three, uh, and you have these, you know, dinosaur bones, you know, wired together, sort of a diorama here uh, in 23B. These rooms have no information and no treasure, but the players are going to try to figure out what is going on. You know, they're going to be looking for other secret doors or niches, or, or, you know, writing on the wall that's invisible. Uh, they're going to be making skill checks or, you know, maybe throwing divination spells or detect magics. And all of this for nothing. Now you can say, hey, that's the price of doing business. That's the price of adventuring. And you know what? Not all the rooms have something either to fight or to get. They're just rooms in a dungeon. But the question here is, how long do you want to let the players, you know, either try to figure stuff out or just ruminate among themselves about what could be going on? Because playing time is valuable. So what I used to do, I had a phrase. I would say, there is nothing of interest here. And my long-term players knew when I said that, I meant there's nothing here, it's time to move on. I didn't use this all the time. Sometimes I allowed them to ruminate. Sometimes I sat there. Sometimes when the players were sort of being, you know, interesting, like the dinosaur, but maybe I might, even though I set this up as just atmosphere, have some, you know, trinket or some item that I'm going to figure out later what it does uh, to give them a little bit of a reward. But again, once I would say there's nothing of interest here, that's it. And that's it for my uh, discussion of the GM secrets of the level two Dungeon of the Mad Mage. If you like what you've seen, subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Leave some comments. I love to read them and hear them. But of course, most importantly, keep playing Dungeons and Dragons, the greatest game ever invented, and tell somebody else about it.